In this episode of The Night Skies, Andrew Gay and Tom Fox visit with Jeff Stone and Eclipse Chaser. Hello and welcome to episode two with Mr. Jeff Stone. I'm your co-host, Andrew Gay, along with Mr. Tom Fox. Hello, Jeff. How are you doing? Thank you for being here. Hello, fellows. I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, we're really excited to uh, talk to you today about the solar eclipse, the two solar eclipses that are coming to our area later this year and the beginning of next year. So let's jump right to it. Let's start off with uh, maybe just an introduction of who you are and some of your background. Hi again, thanks for having me today. I was uh, an airplane mechanic in the Air Force long ago and really enjoyed doing that. And I finally realized one day that I need to have a college degree to do something besides work on airplanes. And lo and behold, I finished my degree and ran across a, an opportunity to go down to the Johnson Space Center and interview for a job to help the astronauts fix their space shuttle while it was flying. For whatever reason, they hired me, and I got to do that for 29 years or so afterwards. So that, that kind of really cemented my aviation and science kind of interest that I've had all my life, and I got involved in a lot of different things, and I met my wife. We heard about a trip that was going to be going down to Mexico to see the eclipse in 1991. Thought that might be a fun thing to do. And so we did. And it was unbelievable. It was life-changing, literally. We flew down to Puerto Vallarta with maybe 200 people all together and, and witnessed the eclipse that was almost seven minutes long, which is just hard to wrap your head around. Wow. The one we're going to have is going to be four and a half minutes. So that's pretty good. Seven minutes is a really long time for darkness in the middle of the day. Yeah. And that, that kind of got us going on. This eclipse thing is pretty cool. Let's see what we can find out. And ultimately, as a result of that encounter, we built a telescope. We even ground the mirror for it, did the whole thing. It's even made out of hockey sticks, so it's unusual. And <clears throat> so we, we just kind of got into the whole sky watching thing. And part of coming to Kerrville was for the dark skies that are here. Houston is not a good place to, to be looking up too much because the night sky is barely there. There's a handful of stars and it's really very disappointing, but you come out here to the hill country and it's wonderful. So yeah. that was part of our decision to wind up here. And then the eclipse was another part of it, even to the extent that we predicated our land purchase on how close it was to the, the center line of the eclipse. Nice. <laughs> we wanted to be home on eclipse day. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Tom? Yeah. Where, where did this passion come from? Was it your work at NASA? Was it you saw something when you were a little boy? Did something fire you in high school or even in the Air Force? Actually, when I was pre-high school, I was in the Boy Scouts and <clears throat> continued that through high school. Even though I didn't get real far in the, the ranks, I was just enthralled with the idea of going out camping and watching the night sky and we did an astronomy thing one time, and I was pretty much hooked on looking up at that point. And then I also had a aviation background. My, my mom's brother was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, a retired brigadier general. And <clears throat> so I was very interested in airplanes, just anything having to do with flying, and including birds. I'm, I love to go watch birds, too. So anything that moves around has been a passion for a long time. How about your work at NASA? I've interviewed a few NASA folks over the years, and there seemed to be a real esprit de corps, even to this, to this day. Simply the, the lunar programs from the 60s and 70s, but people are really proud of NASA, proud of their work, and felt like they were doing important work, like I said, literally up to this day. Oh, absolutely, and your timing on that question is excellent. Today is the second week of our daughter's job working in mission control, following in mom and dad's footsteps. Wow. We could not be prouder of that little girl, <laughs> our little girl. Yes, there's an absolute esprit de course. She senses it, and we've talked about that in the last, she's been there a week and a half now, and we've talked about it. She's stepped into it, and she's soaking it up and really enjoying that. And I was really blessed to have the opportunity to start working there in the late 80s, early 90s, because there were still a lot of guys left over from the Apollo world. I say guys. There were a few ladies yeah. there, too, but mostly sure. guys. The opportunity to work with those people and see what they did, how what they did matters to them. It was just amazing. And the, these people, when they went to the moon, when we went to the moon, I can say it like this, they didn't know what they were doing. They had a good idea what they were doing, but it had never been done. And they were just making it up as they go. And to have the kind of confidence and smarts and 
of course, resources to be able to do something like that is, is just a real rare occasion. And I just love talking to the Apollo guys. I had to meet John Young several times, walked on the moon. He fell down on the moon a bunch of times too. His suit got dirtier than any of the rest. Wow. And um, so to, to talk with him and work with the engineers and, and other people that were around there was just absolutely amazing. And it spoiled me terribly. I was not prepared for a little stint that I did when I left the rink. I left the rink. I left NASA to work at an ice rink. We needed a manager. I thought, yeah, looks like fun. I'll give it a shot. And it was, it was fun for a little while, but it was not me. And I wound up going back to NASA. But part of it was working, at least in the part of NASA that I was in, which is mission operations. Everybody, everybody wanted to be there and wanted to do their job. And an environment like that is just almost impossible. Yeah. So everybody was can do. Everybody was, we're going to get this done. Said, you can't do that. We watch. We'll get it done. And we did lots of things like that. And my particular job was called in-flight maintenance, which is exactly what it sounds like. When the shuttle was flying, when it was on orbit, if something broke, they had to fix it. And, or they decided they didn't need it. But there was a lot of redundancy. But most of the time, we tried to fix things that went wrong. And most of the time, it was something that we hadn't anticipated. So we had to make it up as we went. And that was so much fun. I loved it. When we were sitting there waiting for something to break, it's like, Maytag man, I'm just going to fill in my phones. You may not remember the Maytag man. I, I you probably do. do. I do. Okay. <laughs> Loneliest man in America. That's right. And we lonely sitting in our console in the back room of the Mission Control Center until essentially Houston, we have a problem. And, and then we'd swing into action and work with all the system specialists and all the people who were affected by whatever was wrong. We'd work with them and say, hey, this is what the crew can do. These are the tools that they have. And we'll put together a procedure. And we did and send it up to them. And then we'd look over their shoulder as they executed it. Almost all the time it worked. And we nice. saved the day or whatever. And that being in an environment of people that are so committed to getting the job done was just absolutely amazing. So when I went to work at the rink, that wasn't what I found. I had a lot of good friends there that were working there, but it was an entirely different story. And I was so spoiled by NASA. I said, ah, I'm going back to NASA. Shifting gears just a little bit, let's get into maybe the eclipses that are coming here. We have, let's see if I get this right, the annual, ecl annular eclipse that's at, in October this year, and then the total solar eclipse that's in April of next year. Yeah. yeah. So maybe just if you want to say a few words about what people like a lay person like myself that's never really experienced especially a total solar eclipse like what could someone like myself expect from that experience of kind of setting up and getting ready to watch that first of all for the annular eclipse you want to make sure that you for sure have the proper equipment for viewing the sun and you can check it out today if you go outside and you know where the sun is and you look at it you're going to look away immediately because it's going to hurt you're not going to look at it long enough for it to hurt your eyes. But if something draws your attention to it and compels you to look at it for any length of time, you can really seriously damage your eyes. So that's the number one thing is make sure that you understand what you have and how what you're going to be doing looking at the sun. You can do. There's a lot of ways of doing that. There's an in, there are indirect methods. You can hold up a little box with a hole in it and look at the sun through the it's a pinhole camera is what it boils down to. Oh, okay. It's one way of looking of seeing what's happening without looking directly at it. And then there's of course the eclipse glasses. And we'll all be happy to know that the city of Kerrville is purchasing eclipse glasses and they're purchasing a whole bunch of them and they're going to make them available to us. And we should absolutely use those. And I can't emphasize enough for the annular eclipse, you'll need those the whole time. There's no time you can look at the sun any length of time without eye protection. In my case, on my telescope, I have a big filter that blocks out over 99% of the sunlight, just goes over the end of my telescope and I can use it just like I'm looking at any other, on any given day. And in fact, I'm going to be doing that. At some point, I'm gonna start taking my telescope out and have it on the sidewalk somewhere in town and I'll be the goofball over there. What are you doing? Oh, I'm looking at the sun. Why would you wanna do that? Been through this so much times. But so the number one thing about the annular eclipse is make sure that you have the right equipment to, to look at. It. Welding glasses aren't the right equipment. They take it down enough that you can look at it long enough that you can hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. So make sure you've got the right things. And then for the, so what happens is the sun is doing its thing. 
and the moon moves in front of it, but the moon's just far enough away that it can't quite cover the entire disk of the sun. Okay, so it's here you can't see very much of my hand, but now you see a lot more of it. So that apparent distance changes when the moon's farther from the earth, and then so it's not quite big enough to cover the sun. Then there will be a ring around the outside of the full brightness of the sun, and that's enough to hurt you. Got it. But it's also really cool because 98% of the sunlight isn't coming to the earth. So everything gets dim. And it's really, it's very eerie. We experienced one of these in El Paso in 1994. And that was really exciting. We managed to get to be on the 50 yard line of the sun ball for that one. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But then the, uh, the total eclipse is entirely different. The run up to it, when the moon is moving across the face of the sun, it starts out being just a little bite. And you've seen that. And you've probably seen that in your lifetime. And then the bite gets bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, the sun's gone. And the temperature immediately starts going down. And everybody around you is just excited and yelling and just, whoa, there it is. And then around the outside of the horizon, assuming you're high enough to see much of a horizon, you'll see basically sunrise or sunset all the way around. Instead of just in the west or just in the east, it's all the way around. And that looks really strange. And if you look at the sun, which now you can without any kind of eye protection, you can look at the sun and you'll see the corona, which is kind of like northern lights. It's, it's a dim glow and it moves slowly if you watch it. And it's just a crazy looking thing. It's always there, but we can't see it because the sun is so, but it's the it's millions of miles out from the sun and, and it just flows around. And if there's a planet nearby, probably Mercury or Venus, you'd be able to see that and bright stars that are in the vicinity of the sun. And how many times have you seen anything near the sun when you've looked up in the sky? Yeah, never. Uh, I have a lot because I try to do that. Sure. Safely. Tom? Yeah, I want to actually turn to Friends of the Night and Dark Skies. Okay. The Friends of the Night and the Dark Skies are a program, I'm going to say, to really help people understand what light pollution is, how it impacts the environment, how it impacts our ability to enjoy this glorious, nice sky we have in the hill country and I wanted to use that as a long-winded way to introduce the topic and ask you to tell us about what are the Friends of the Night and the Dark Skies program. We are technically called the Kerr County Friends of the Night Sky. This rolls right off the tongue and our fancy little acronym is KC. Okay, it rolls off just as easily. But what we are is a group of all volunteers that are, are very concerned about trying to preserve what you mentioned that dark skies that we do have here. <clears throat> if you look at some of the photos from space of the United States, it's pretty interesting that I-35 is a vertical line through the middle of the country. And east of I-35, there's glow almost over the entire country. And that's even in pictures from 2018. So now, you know, it's not getting any better. It's getting worse. But west of I-35, there's a lot of dark areas. And Kerrville is right on what we're calling the edge of night. And that was the name of an old soap opera, wasn't it? That just hit me. <laughs> the edge of night. The edge of night. Yeah. They had the Mayfair Maytag repairman as an ad. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Anyway, so we still have pretty good dark skies here. Now, if you're in downtown Kerrville and you look up, you'll see a lot of stars, certainly a lot more stars than you would in Houston. But at my house, which is right off of Goat Creek Road, not quite to the interstate, I go out into my driveway and I see the Milky Way. Virtually, it's not cloudy. Yeah. I see the Milky Way. Especially during the summer. I've noticed that. Here. Yes. Depending on what time of year, it's more prominent than others. But it's still the Milky Way. And the Andromeda Galaxy, you've heard of that. Sure. Closest right? one? It's the closest galaxy. Well, I used to know the M, the catalog reference. I don't remember it. It was M31. 31. That's yeah. right. There you go. And, and it's got a satellite galaxy 32, which is not too far from it. Anyway, I can see the Andromeda galaxy naked eye from my driveway. And that just warms my heart. I love being able to do that. I've got really good eyes, so that helps. But it is dark enough to be able to see it. Yeah. And that's really exciting. So the, back to the Kirk County Friends of the Night Sky. We've been an organization for, I think, almost three years. I think it started getting organized right before the pandemic started. And then I joined partway through, but I've been with them for well over a year now. And 
our, our entire goal is to try to educate people and make people aware of what they can do to preserve what we have and maybe even make it better. And there's ways to do both. And they're not necessarily difficult. They're not necessarily expensive. In fact, that's changed a whole lot. Back in the day when some of those pictures of the night sky were taken or of the, of the earth at night were taken, it was more expensive to try to, to find fixtures and methods of shielding or hiding your lights so they're not so upward pointing. But nowadays, that's just as normal as any other kind of fixture or installation that you can do. And there's no reason not to do that. And that's part of why the city of Kerrville has wisely recently passed an, the first reading of an ordinance to try to put the night sky within the city limits. And I'm real excited about that. And there's no question that's the right thing to do. It's going to, the implementation, of course, is where all the details are going to be. So that really led to my next question was, which is, What's been the reception by the city of Kerrville? Can you expand it to greater Kerr County as well? We, as, as far as I know, we have not, we've not made a real effort to talk to the county commissioner's court about it formally. We have spoken with various members of them and everybody, how can you say you're not for dark skies? It just doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense if you think about it. And the problem with the county is they have limited ways of enforcing anything. So even though they can make proclamations and say, yes, we want to preserve dark sky, which they have done, as far as passing any kind of laws or ordinances, that's not something that's going to happen. But we are trying real hard to educate people. I went and spoke to a homeowners association last weekend to try to explain why we want to keep the skies dark and that there are ways of doing that very easily. And it can even save you money. It was the first part of your question. I'm not you got it. Sure. I got it. Okay, good. Yeah. I did, did you have any other questions you want to build on off of that before I kind of shift gears? I wanted to ask maybe you, out of your perspective and what you've seen out of your experience with seeing some eclipses in person over the years, what was the response from the local communities? I've, I guess analogies about towns being overrun with a locust type of swarm of, of people. So I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe what you've seen out of your personal experience over the years. I've seen two total eclipses. The first one was the one in Mexico that I mentioned. And what was kind of interesting about that was we were the, I was a locust. We, sure. our group got on a bus at our hotel in Puerto Vallarta and we drove for four hours through the countryside to this place that this guy who organized it all, his name is Paul Maley. And he's an amazing person. He's done 75 eclipse trips. Wow. Or thereabouts. Yeah. And lots of other kinds of adventure vacation things. So he had figured out where the center line was going to be and where the maximum eclipse was going to be and where he thought the best weather was going to be. And it was a hilltop in probably a couple, maybe an hour inland of the Pacific Ocean on the western edge of Mexico. And the hilltop had an abandoned airstrip on it. And it was a little village of people that lived along the edge of the airstrip. And <clears throat> we drove our big old Mexican tour bus up there, which caught on fire. And we put out with our water bottles while we were driving. It's reminiscent of in-flight maintenance. Right? I was going to say, in-flight maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> Making it up exactly. as you go. <laughs> exactly. And so we got there, and everybody piles out of the bus. And these are people almost all from the Johnson Space Center. So they're techies. They're nerds. In 1991. And we didn't have cell phones. We had, I had a camcorder, which was pretty amazing because I had access to one for my job and astronauts used to train with. And I brought that along so that I could video some of the things that were going on. It was kind of out there in 1990. And so all these people are standing around or they're getting their telescopes that they brought to observe and record the thing with and all this. And, are, and we're waiting and we're watching and these high clouds are coming in. Oh man, it's cloudy. What are we going to do? It's not like we're going to get in our car and drive somewhere else. I mean, we're, we're hoping the bus is going to get us back to the hotel. And we actually were on two buses. One group of people decided we can't take the risk. We're going to get on the bus and go down to the beach and try to watch the eclipse from there. So they saddled up and headed out. And we stayed at the airport. And it was very interesting because as clouds were, they were real high, thin clouds. And they were moving really slowly. And we had a satellite phone to call back to the weather guys at the Johnson Space Center and get the latest, you know, what's coming down from the satellite views right now for Central Mexico. And that was actually just amazing to me. We had the technology 
and get on a phone. And the thing was this big, yeah. you know, the antenna sticking out. It was like a World War II walkie-talkie. And so they're talking to them, and I'm thinking, you know, if I could just look and memorize what the sky looks like and close my eyes for a few seconds and then open them again, I could see which way they were going. And I realized, I got a video camera right here. I can do 30 seconds of video and then fast forward it and see what's going on. So I did. And sure enough, it looked like they were going to be getting thinner. And as it turns out, they did. And I think it was partially a result of the temperature change of the eclipse happening because the solar energy changes. It, once there's a shadow in front of it, there's a lot less energy, right? So we had these high clouds and we're looking to the southwest. And all of a sudden, you could see the black edge of the shadow. The shadow is like 150 miles across. And the one here is going to be 120 miles across. Okay. We're 60 miles from San Antonio. So the very edge of San Antonio is going to have total eclipse. We're going to be in the middle of it. And then Junction is going to be just inside the western edge. But we're dead center. In fact, my house is 0.97 miles off of the center line, in case you're wondering. And so we, back to Mexico, we see the edge of the shadow ripping towards us. And I had no idea how fast it was going. I've since learned it was moving about 1,500 miles an hour. And this thing just comes, and it was like the movie, I can't remember the name of it, Day Judgment, where the ship comes over. I don't I could, know, but anyway, I Star get it. Wars. The, the cruiser. <laughs> anyway, yeah. At the opening of Star Wars. Giant yeah. darkness just everywhere. Yeah, Tom would know that. Exactly. And around, <laughs> I do. And around the edge, like I said earlier, it was like sunset all the way around. And the kids that were living in the little village over there started screaming and yelling and, and just being excited. Roosters started crowing. The mosquitoes came out like crazy. Mm. And you wow. could feel the temperature go down immediately. And all the geeky astronomers are over there with their telescopes. And they're looking into their telescopes and watching this thing and taking pictures. I'm looking around just absolutely amazed. I have a video, by the way, on my YouTube channel that they've compiled of all this stuff, which is okay. really fun to watch. What is your YouTube channel? Do it's, you know uh, the name? Yes. My, my son likes to make up words, and he declared himself to be Mr. Jurgen Doggen. So that made me Jurgen Daddy. So it's J U R G E N D A D Y, Jurgen Daddy. And if you find that, there's a bunch of other videos there, but do Jurgen Daddy Eclipse and you can find it. It's about, it's almost 30 minutes, and it's a music video that one of the local guys, again, a bunch of techie guys, yeah. right? He, we had a meeting after we got back, and he requested any copies of photos or videos or anything anybody had, and took them to his place, and a month later, he was done with this thing, and he'd made a 30-minute music video of the Puerto Vallarta Eclipse experience. And it's really cool. It's really bad, because there's a lot of this. I yeah. recorded off of VHS onto digital, so sure. there's a lot of video noise and everything on it. So that was Mexico experience. There was, there's a lot more detail to it. I remember I said, I exclaimed in utter amazement as the shadow hit us. I looked at my watch and said, they were exactly right on what time it was going to happen. To the second for where we were standing in Mexico, somebody predicted that. And I'm still blown away by that. These things are moving through space and spinning wow. and somebody knows yeah. how to figure that out. But they're going to be right on Oh my, August 8th, 2024, and also October 14th, 2023. Yeah. And it's going to happen right here. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we're expecting a lot of influx of people oh, for that. there's that, yes. The city is thinking, and I think I can say this confidently, in the meetings that we've had, talking about a couple of hundred thousand people in the Kerrville vicinity. A couple yeah. of hundred thousand people. No, I know we were just talking about we will not be eating out that day. We'll be no. staying home. And I think a lot of people <laughs> might be staying home from work. Um, I would expect most people are going to be staying home from work. Ingram ISD has already canceled school for that day. Yeah. If you think about trying to get just trying to just get that many people in the vicinity of Kerrville, there's not going to be any roads that are passable in any way to reasonably think about it. That's one of the big challenges for emergency management is making sure they keep lanes open for emergency traffic. Yes. Is that me? No. Okay. That's right. Motorcycle. All right. Yeah. I like motorcycles too. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so getting around on Eclipse Day on April 8th, 2024, which is going to be virtually impossible. And I just can't emphasize enough that people, local people in the area need to have thought about that 
and be prepared, whatever prescriptions or any other kind of emergency stuff that they have to have. Don't plan on going anywhere on April 8th, 2024 for anything. It sounds it's like it's happen. a kind of a three-day preparation or three-day gig. With it. If it's going to be on a Monday, I'm sure you'll right. be rocking and rolling for the weekend. That's right. And the city's got great plans for all kinds of events. They've got five venues. At least Hayes wow. Park is going to be just overrun with people. We've got some other things planned. And the idea is that if all these people are here, hopefully they'll come in slowly. They'll show up and they'll sure. nail down their little place and they'll establish where they are. But then the one thing that I've noticed about eclipses is that as soon as they're now nobody's thinking about hanging out and sticking around. They're thinking about getting getting on the road and getting home. And when we went to the eclipse in Herman, Missouri in 2017, that was exactly the case. We stayed where we were for several hours, a little bed and breakfast on a hilltop out of the edge of town. And we finally said, okay, maybe it's time, maybe it's safe, we can head home. We couldn't get anywhere near the freeway. Wow. So we headed out down these country roads and took back roads and had some close calls with some trucks. We were in an RV and it was pretty exciting. But we eventually, after I'd say probably 10 or 12 hours, things were starting to get back to normal. So I-10 is going to be an absolute mess Monday afternoon, April 8th, and probably 35 and all the way, you know, could, and that's another thing to think about. All these people that experienced the eclipse of 2017, and I've seen estimates of 150 million Americans saw that total eclipse. That's half the population. Uh, yeah. yeah. And a bunch of them got excited, like me, and a bunch of them want to see the next one. They're going to go, hmm, look, it's going to happen today. It's going to go right across I-10. And what is that, Kerrville? Who, what's Kerrville? But look, we can go over to 35 and get there from Minnesota, or we can come from South Carolina and get on 10 and we're there. We are accessible to the entire country and it is going to be a zoo. Yeah. So we need to think about that and prepare for that, both in terms of experiencing the eclipse and just getting through the weekend. Yeah. Most of the hotels and RV parks and everything are, are having three or four night minimums. So they're encouraging people to come in Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Again, to try to throttle the influx and then try to get people to stay until Tuesday and not everybody leave at once on Monday because that's going to be, it's going to be an experience <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So you've told us about your YouTube site. <laughs> if any of our listeners wanted any more information on either the Friends of Night or the Kerrville website, mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about more about preparing for the eclipse? What would be the best places for them? Sure. The City Convention and Visitors Bureau. Kerrville CVB. Yes, sir. .com, I think. Is there, is that right off the top of my head? At any rate, KerrvilleEclipse.com will take you there. And I believe also KerrvilleEclipse.org. But Kerrville Eclipse for sure. KerrvilleEclipse.com. Thank you to the official website. As far as activities and planning, the Facebook page is where we're going to primarily be doing social media stuff. And that's just Kerrville Eclipse on Facebook. I finally went to it the other day and saw it. And there's not a whole lot there right now, but we're trying to get some content going and get some buzz going for that so that people can use that as a resource as well. And then the Kirk County Friends of the Night are part of the Hill Country Alliance organization. And so you can get to us through the hillcountryalliance.org. Is that right? And then... I should know the name of our website right off the top of my head. And I assume it's Kirk County Friends of the Night Sky. I was going to say, if you just give it a good old Google. Or DuckDuckGo. Or DuckGo. Yeah. And that was an interesting thing we did after the meeting the other day. Somebody mentioned that Google didn't bring up Kerrville and Eclipse very readily. And so I got on DuckDuckGo and it was like the number three thing that was on there. So it depends. Yeah. And it's it's hillcountryalliance.org. .org. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. They've got tons and tons of information. And real quick on Dark Skies, the Hill Country Alliance is affiliated with the International Dark Sky Association. And there's lots of good information there about why, besides being able to see the stars, there's lots of good reasons to try to preserve the night sky. All of nature has lived with dark skies since the beginning. And now in the last hundred years, we're taking that away. And that's really upsetting a lot of things, including people. So there there are lots of good reasons from a holistic perspective to to work to try to preserve the night sky. Awesome. All right. 
Thank you again for your time, Jeff. This has been a great interview. I've very much enjoyed this. We look forward to continuing our education and learning about the Kerrville Eclipse and what we got coming up at the end of this year and beginning of next year. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. This is Tom Fox again. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Night Sky. I hope you will join Andrew and I again. If you have any interest in Eclipse, you have been to an Eclipse, or you'd like to visit about the upcoming Eclipses, which will occur in Kerrville, Texas, we'd love to have you on our podcast. Please give me an email, shout at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. The Night Sky, a podcast on eclipses coming to Kerrville, is a production of the Texas Hill Country Podcast Network.